Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you out there. And we're very lucky this morning, very fortunate to have Charlie with us. And uh, Charlie is the National Coordinator on Australia. And he's someone who we all love very much and he inspires us. And this particular program this morning is titled a future without fear, something that we all want very, very much. Thanks, Charlie. <clears throat> so thank you so much, Sally. And it's very lovely to be up in the Blue Mountains. Um, I live in Sydney and I just came up yesterday and <clears throat> it's a perfect day here today in such a lovely atmosphere. And as Sally mentioned, today I'm just going to share a few of my thoughts about the temperature of the world at the moment. And I think all of us can feel that the, the minds of humanity, the temperature of the mind of humanity seems to be rising with, unfortunately, feelings of anxiety and fear about what's happening in our world and what our future will be. And last week, someone said to me, you know, shared a thought. And as you know, we're at a time everyone's got an opinion about what's happening in our world at the moment. And sometimes I think a lot of us feel overwhelmed by all the opinions and beliefs that people have. But this person said to me that the physical virus is one thing which is of a big challenge to all of us but the mental virus of fear seems to be, you know, growing the whole thing in our minds and our world. And I think a huge part of the spiritual journey is learning about fear, observing my own inner fears and beginning to work with them so that I don't feel controlled by my fears, but I really start to let my fears go and really, I often feel that's freedom in life, when I can free myself from the confines of my own fears. And some say that there's two prime emotions in life. They are <clears throat> love and fear. All of us know how absolutely paralyzing fear can be, but we also know how completely life-changing love can be. And some say even that love is letting go fear. Many years ago, I remember a friend of mine in Melbourne, um, his mum, I knew her quite well, her name was Lynn. And Lynn was a very lovely person, very, very lovely person, but she would describe herself as quite a fearful, nervous, anxious sort of person. And she contracted cancer, and that just increased her whole sense of worry, fear, anxiety. And one day my friend rang me and said, mama has been told that <clears throat> the cancer is terminal and she's not going to survive. So would you go and see her? So I went to see her in a hospital in Melbourne. And the whole thing is sort of so clearly recorded in the video of the intellect. You know how the intellect has this incredible <laughs> database of videos of life. Because I went about dusk and I walked down this long hallway in a, the hospital. And when I came to her room, it was absolutely dark in her room and it was so quiet. You know, sometimes when there's such a silence, you feel you don't even want to break it. So I, I tippy toed in just so carefully and I sat down, I was so quiet. Myself, and I just, just sat there in this dark and I could just see her silhouette in the bed. And after a few minutes, a voice came from the bed and she said, Charlie, I love you. And quite honestly, that was totally uncharacteristic of this lady. And she has sort of herself said about <clears throat> herself that once she knew she wasn't going to survive, she thought, I've got nothing to lose. I may as well be the person I want to be and express my love. And that actually had quite a huge impact on me, how... Often in life, we just live within my fears. I'm afraid of what people think. I'm afraid of people's criticism. 
I'm afraid that if I'm a bit vulnerable about what's going on, what people will think. We're always, and this lady, when she decided that, well, I've got nothing to lose. Let me just be the person I want to be. And I think it's a, it was a great learning for me. And I often, am I really being the person I want to be? Or am I living within the confines of all my own fears? Because, you know, to me, the most elevated experience of life is the experience of love. And often they say the pinnacle of spirituality is the experience of divine love and pure love. And always I find when I meditate and I feel love, I just observe my inner world. I feel so relaxed, so content, so easy. There's absolutely no doubt my attitude to other people transforms. I feel much more kinder and forgiving and understanding. But when fear grips the mind, the millisecond fear grips the mind, the heart begins to palpitate, the stomach churns, adrenaline you know, curses through the system. And just as love seems to be the seed of so much positive emotion, fear is the seed of so much negative emotion. And we feel stress, we feel anxious, we feel tense, and the mind begins to imagine. You know, the paranoia kicks in, and the mind seems to think all these wild thoughts about possible outcomes and scenarios. And so we can't relax, we can't concentrate, we can't sleep. That's the power of fear when we come under its influence. And I once read some really interesting research because we know from our life experience that our emotional state affects the material form. And it seems absolutely obvious that, you know, how I feel mentally and emotionally, it translates into my physical body. And some research says that there's a huge connection between fear and heart. And if I was to say now, you know, I'm sitting in this room, there's a few others in this room too. <laughs> there's a fire in this room. What's the first thing that would happen? Boom, 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 boom. Your heart starts to go. If every day I wake up in the morning and I have fear of something happening, I have fear of a personality, I have fear of an authority figure in my life, my boss at work, I have fear that something I've been a little bit dis dishonest about, people will find out. That fear keeps putting pressure on my heart and the heart is just a little pump. And so at some point the heart will break down. And this is why really spirituality not only uplifts my spirit, it's actually an investment in physical well-being too. The more I keep my mind in a peaceful state, that energy translates to my physical organs. But when fear is ruling in my mind constantly, and just with the virus at the moment, and all the conversations, oh, you know, the economy will crash, we won't have jobs, we won't have money, all the scenarios, building, building, this atmosphere of fear we absorb, what does it do? It puts pressure on my heart, and that has its own consequences. But the reality is we do live in a world of fear, unfortunately. And sometimes I think, you know, <clears throat> at night time, we all watch the news on television, <laughs> turn on the news, and it's just one story after the other, isn't it? And we, I often think that window in the corner of my room, and it takes me to every little corner of our planet. And we watch people suffering and people in fear. So many parts of our world are not safe. Homes aren't safe, nowhere is safe. And now with this virus, there's sort of this atmosphere of fear and tension around the world. But they're like, that's like the big picture. And most of us specialize in our own unique forms of fear. And one of the things which, you know, I found when I first started to teach meditation, um, I felt a little bit nervous, fearful of speaking in front of audiences. And I can remember actually 
talking, asking somebody. And I found out that one of the main fears of most people is talking in front of others because we feel judged. You know, some actors, they can perform in front of thousands, but if they have to be themselves, they find it very, very difficult. And even I remember talking to a woman, she was on a retreat that we were conducting, very lovely person. And she told me she has a big fear of being rejected. And every time she gets close to someone, she's a little bit scared that that person may reject them or not like them or what, you know, whatever it is. And actually, that is probably one of the most common fears of most of us, that we fear that others won't like me or love me or won't give me that sense of belonging. Even I remember another friend of mine was in Europe and Australia, and actually he was a concert pianist brilliant pianist and he told me that the best piano players in the world no one knows because when they get in front of a big audience their fingers clam up and they they get the fear because <clears throat> classical music almost everyone knows every note you know they know every note and so they're listening one mistake people will know and I think no matter who we are we have our own set of fears but on the spiritual journey, we start to go deep, deep, deep. What are the seeds? Where do they come from <clears throat> that create fears in my life? And I really want to talk about three in particular. And the first one I would call like physical fears, which is the fear of loss of health, <clears throat> illness, or even old age, a loss of wealth, possessions, material things, and at the heart of physical fears is the fear of loss. And the law says, the spiritual law, whatever I attach my heart to, whether it's a person, whether it's a thing, whether it's a responsibility, the more I attach my heart, the law says, the more I build fear of losing that thing. So as I identify with that thing and I hold on to it, they, I build fear into my own life. And probably, as they say, the, the main fear for most of us is the fear of losing my body, the fear of death. But it's not actually only that. It's like when you look at the way we live our lives today, we're born, we're sort of given an identity from childhood. You're a male and you're a female and this is your family and this is your country. And, you know, you're building up this whole sense of identity. And during my life, you know, I developed this whole sense of who I am. And so the idea of death is not just of leaving this, but it's leaving my honor, my prestige, my successes, you know, my image I've created the respect in the community, a whole lot of things which have fed me with certain needs in my life. And I think, to me, one of the most beautiful things of spirituality is that it takes me so deep to understand really what is important. And I would say that the first step in beginning to deal with fear is to understand there's nothing but change going on. <clears throat> they say in life, the only permanent thing that happens is change. And once I was in at the Brahma Kumaris in London and we, they did a program and one of the speakers was John Cleese, who's a, most of you would know, a British comedian who was in Monty Python, that's what he's famous for. And, um, He's dabbled in Buddhism and he was talking about impermanence. And he came out and um, the audience was not sure how to respond because, you know, when you see John Cleese, you laugh. <laughs> so everyone started to laugh, but he was being so serious. It was quite <laughs> funny. And he, was, he gave the analogy that life is like a train journey. Life is the train. And when you stop at a station, people hop on the train, people hop off. You go to the next station, people hop on, people hop off. Eventually you hop off. 
And it's like life means that people come into your life, people go out of your life. Wealth comes into your life, wealth goes out of your life. Responsibilities come in, they go. Actually, you know, you can enjoy it and love it. But when I hold on and I say mine, I instantly build fear in my life. And this is why they say ultimately wisdom is to love everything, enjoy everything, engage with life, but don't attach your heart. And so most of us say, well, sounds great, but it's almost impossible. But actually spirituality says to understand what is permanent in all this change, what is constant in all this change. And the constant is the permanent self. In all this change, everything that happens, what is always there is the permanent self, the consciousness. And this is why the first step in spirituality to deal with fear is to understand there's nothing but change. But the second step is to understand and experience the eternal self. And actually, I've been thinking recently that, you know, we, there's a lot of stress in the world. In the 1980s, they, the Time magazine did this whole issue on stress. And, you know, they, there's many layers of stress, change and that. But, you know, the seed for me is when I base my life on falsehood. If the fundamental of my life is false and the falsehood, which is creating so much stress and fear, is that I am a temporary body. When I buy into that falsehood, that the reality of life is that I am a temporary body, it produces two personalities that just fill my head with so much fear. And the first, first personality is my ego. And when my ego is ruling in my inner system, I have, you know, so much fear that people will see through my facade, that I'm not as good as I look, I'm not as confident as I look, I have self-doubt, I have fear that I can't live up to others' expectations of me, you know, these sorts of things. So when I think I'm a temporary body, the more I identify with this temporary identity, on the one hand, it builds ego, and that ego fills me with fear. There's a deep relationship between ego and fear. The more ego I have, the more fear I have of, you know, people really seeing through the facade or the image that I want to convey to other people. But the second personality is the ego of inferiority. It's my lack of self-respect. And this is the personality that fears not being loved, fears rejection, fears the future, fears what will happen to me when I get old, fear, 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 or there's just so much fear. And because most of us are bought up with the absolute assumption that you're a temporary body, our heads are full of so many fears. We have so many fears. And this is why spirituality says that now I have to know, experience, and love the permanent self. And the whole journey of spirituality, and just this morning in all our centers, we have classes. And I was thinking that the education of spirituality is so different because the education in the world is information. We know so much information. But the education of spirituality is to take just one idea and start to research it in the laboratory of your mind. Who am I? I am the eternal soul. And the soul, we can never stop learning about it or hearing about it because the soul lives around the pituitary gland. As we understand, the soul enters the body when the quickening happens in the womb. The soul has no label before that. No sex, no age, no country, no nationality, no religion, no education, zero. It's just a soul, a consciousness. But it sits on the forehead of you know, my temporary self 
And then it starts to identify with all the temporary labels. The more I identify, the more I fear losing them. And actually, the whole first step of spirituality is coming home to a place in myself where I feel absolutely comfortable and settled with who I am. That I am an eternal soul. I've lived before this body, I'll live after this body. And death is nothing more than the driver stepping out of the car and getting a new model once again. And, you know, really I think that one of the, the seed of so much fear in this world is death. And I, I do feel that because of what we're seeing at the moment is this wave of discomfort in all of us because we've been brought up with this idea that of what death is. Death is final. Death is the end. Because we become dependent on so many people and things in this life. But actually, when we start to experience myself as a soul, we understand that death is just change. Death is nothing more than change. And as I begin to experience that change, then I start to really come to terms. And it takes time, there's absolutely no doubt. My own experience is that each time I meditate, I begin to let go all the labels of this temporary body and establish myself. And as I've practiced and trained myself, I start to live more as a soul. You start to see really what death is in reality. And I think to free myself as sometimes people call it, the demons of death, and understand it's just change. It's like a snake shedding a skin. You know, we will continue, and the soul will take its story to its next life. And sometimes I think, you know, when you look at the, the journey of life as we do it today, I'm born, I say, this is my mum, this is my dad, these are my brothers, my sisters, this is my town, this is my country, this is my profession, this is my partner, these are my children. You think this whole identity, and in one second we leave it, as we understand we're reborn once again, and then what do we do? We're born again, this is my mum, this is my dad, these are my brothers, these are my I adopt a whole new identity of my body. And this is really at this very foundation of meditation practice, it's not imagination. It's actually going deep into the experience of who I am. And you start to see clearly that I am the permanent self, the permanent soul. So the first set of fears are physical fears. The second set I would call psychological fears. And these are sort of mental fears of failure or change, emotional fears of, you know, in terms of relationships. But there's something in psychology they call phobias. And phobias, if you Google phobias, you know, there's about 400 known phobias. And in psychology, they used to call them irrational fears, irrational fears. But actually, they're not irrational at all. And all these are associated with past experiences in my life. So I'd say the first step in dealing with fear is to understand there's no, nothing but change. The second step is to experience who I really am as a soul. The third step is to understand really what the soul is and how the soul stores memory. Because it's often in my memory that fear is stored and it's like a shadow that comes over my life when a situation comes in front of you. And when we go deep into the soul, the soul has three aspects. The mind, which collects the data of life through what I see, what I hear. The intellect assesses the data that part of you constantly, at every millisecond, sorting out the data and how do I respond? Once the intellect makes a decision, you do an action. You say something, you do something. 
every action is recorded in my subconscious. The amazing thing about all of us, we may be sitting at home watching this at the moment, each one of us carries a perfect record of our past in our subconscious. And as we have become body conscious, things have happened that have recorded fear in my memory track. And so once I've recorded fear, when a situation similar comes in front of me, instantly I feel fearful. Or something happened in the present makes me feel anxious. Anxiety is fear of the future. And so we begin to see that if, you know, if as a child I'm bitten by a dog, then every time I see a dog, even one this big, <laughs> I think, you know, I'm fearful. If as a child I didn't really feel truly loved in my family, in almost every relationship I struggle with that sense of acceptance or belonging or whatever it may be. And so the past is overlaying and creating the present. So we have all these phobias and, you know, there's claustrophobia, which is like a fear of confined space. Aviophobia is the fear of flying. Agrophobia is the fear of going out. You'd, you'd be amazed. And I even remember here in the Blue Mountains when we, when we started, we had an electrician who came to do some work and it was down below. And I think most of you watching know how beautiful this place is. And he was looking at the stone cottage and the waterfall down there and he said, this place is so beautiful, so beautiful. Well, I wouldn't want to live here, he said. Like, <laughs> and I said, oh, that's weird, why? And he said, spiders. <laughs> he said, I'm an arachnophobiac. Took me a while to learn that word, actually. <laughs> I'm an arachnophobiac. And so we all have our fears, but actually all these phobias are directly connected with the past. They're directly connected with the past. And, you know, sometimes we have not just physical fears like emotional fears. Sometimes some of us feel really afraid to express an opinion because or even to open my mouth in front of other people because I've lived in societies, maybe as a woman, where opinions aren't wanted or whatever. And so my past overlays and creates fear in the present. And often my experience in the present is triggered by the past. So I start to think, you know, I become anxious about things happening in the future. You know, once I was in South Africa and I was in a, a lovely place called Port Elizabeth and I was doing a talk and one man asked at the end, you know, how much fear is real and how much is imagined? And my answer was, I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> but I said, I, I think about 90% would be imagined. He said, I Googled it. And you know, everything, all truth lies on Google these days. Um, and he said, some research says 93% of fear is imagined fears, anxiety. So each time this discomfort, this unpleasant feeling, this anxiety in my mind about what might happen, that big question, it's a creation of my own inner world. And this is why we can really begin to deal with that when we start to meditate. Because three things happen when we meditate. The first is that we really learn to take the sacred space of my mind into such a incredibly sweet feeling. It's not even peace. It's just this incredible feeling of well-being and lightness inside, such a sweet feeling. But secondly, the meditation begins to clear the effect of the past story. So the more I start to reconnect with my permanent self, it starts to reconnect with that in my subconscious. And so all the habits based on the fear of loss 
of my temporary self and my temporary identity has less and less power over me. So just by knowing and experiencing who I am, I start to clear the habitual patterns in my subconscious. But even thirdly, I do actions because thoughts are the seeds of actions. When I meditate, in my meditation, my thoughts are peaceful, benevolent. They become the seeds of my behavior. Meditation is the greatest investment in a positive future, I would say. And so dealing with fear, nothing but change going on. Secondly, experiencing my true self. Thirdly, understanding my subconscious. And I have habits from the past, like shadows of fear over the present. And as I begin to meditate, I clear them. But even fourthly, I would say, um, really beginning to understand that an experience that I am a soul, but everyone else is too. Because, you know, one of the great fears is the fear of authority and authority figures. A lot of people have so many issues around being told what to do, being forced to do things. And there can be so many fears like that. And or fear of expressing my opinion, as I would say. But actually, when I begin to see beyond the role of the body, it's almost like when I realize I'm a soul, I'm like an actor. <clears throat> Each actor's wearing the costume. Sometimes some actors are bosses, some actors are leaders, some actors are this, some actors are that. But actually, when I consider myself a soul and see everyone else as a soul too, I lo lose that fear. And sometimes I think that when I'm body conscious, I, my vision, I, I see somebody, I see their body, their set of labels, and I feel superior or I feel inferior, mostly inferior. It's not conscious. We don't consciously think that. But I think I get impressed and I think, oh, this person, and maybe I, I look up to them or I feel superior. Soul consciousness is the vision of equality. We're actually a human family, male, female, old, young, culture, all of that is all based on limited identity. And the soul, when I really become soul conscious, I think people feel that when you meet them, you just don't meet their set of labels, but you actually connect with who they really are. <clears throat> and I would say then the third set of fears is perhaps, <clears throat> if I could call them maybe spiritual fears, if I could say that, the fear of the unknown, even the fear of God. A lot of people, religious people, have the fear of God because of their background. The fear of my own dishonesty. I've been dishonest in the past. That may come in front of me. The fear of my own mistakes. And these sorts of things can be big fears in the minds that create a lot of guilt, shame, and these sorts of things. And this is why when I begin to understand the universal law of truth, <clears throat> the universal law of truth says that for every action, there is a reaction. For every cause, there is an original effect, so to speak. There's an effect. As I do, so I reap all of that sort of stuff. And it's like there's these universal laws. And if I contravene universal laws and truth, I will suffer for it. And that's why really a wise person understands that, you know, I have to be honest with myself, honest with God and honest with others. Because I once remember I was in a country in one part of the world and this country is described, and I never like these labels, but it will make help you understand as a third world country, not so developed. And I was doing a program for some people who work for the government and it was a three day retreat. 
And near the end, one of the participants spoke to me and he said he wanted to speak privately and he said, I've got so much fear in my life. I'm terrified, he said. And I said, why? And he said, well, I wanted to send my children to Europe for an education because I wanted them to have a good education. My wage didn't give me enough, so I took bribes all my working life. And he said, in his own words, he said, I've, my children are well settled, they have a good life, but I've ruined my own life. He, in his own words, he said, I'm terrified that people will find out what I've done. And he said, every day I live in fear. And so sometimes we ourselves do actions that create fear in my life. Because of my desires, <clears throat> my greed or whatever, I step outside my truth. I break my own principles and then I suffer for it. And, and this is why I think that when we go deep into spirituality, we realize if we always live by my fundamental truths and principles, I can remain, feel comfortable inside. I can sleep peacefully, etc. And so I would say even honesty frees me from fear. And to be honest with myself is not a small thing. I feel that over time we've got so many inbuilt self-deception. It's so much self-deception that we've built inside our head that we don't even realize sometimes when we're not being honest with myself. We have blind spots. And a part of spirituality too is actually learning. If I keep getting feedback from people about behavior and things like that, and I don't listen because none of us like to be criticized, but when I really listen, I can learn. I'm, all of us have weakness. It's like we're all in a spiritual university learning to bring change within myself. And so the spiritual recipe, I would say, to deal with fear is first to have a loving relationship with myself as a soul. And the effect of this is to heal the relationship with the self. Really, the way I'm seeing the world now, the chaos on our planet is one simple reason. There is chaos in the first relationship in life of the majority of humanity. We don't know who we are. The way we treat ourselves is so negative, if I can say, or really unpleasant. And so if I treat myself in that way, that's how I treat everything around me. And as I begin to have this relationship with myself, it's permanent. It's no matter what changes around me. And life means so much change. There was one British historian who said there's been more change in the last 50 years than the whole of history put together. So it's going to change and it's going to change even more. If I have a secure relationship, I know who I am. I'm a soul. I know my qualities. I even know the weaknesses I have to change. But it's... It's a stable relationship. This is the first step in meditation. But the second step in meditation is to really know and experience that relationship with God. And I, I know that when we, you know, we talk about God, there's so many different responses because, you know, sometimes a lot of us have had a religious background and a lot of us feel a lot of love for God, but some of us have a lot of resistance. As soon as we hear that word, a sort of resistance comes up in us because I think, you know, often we think of religion more than God. And religion has told us God will punish you, God will do this, God will do that. So we have this image in our head and it's something I don't want to know about. And yet... I would say one of the main ways to deal with fear is to know and experience myself and have this permanent relationship with God. So many of our fears are around our relationships and loss of relationship, etc. And when I really explore God as the soul, in this beautiful image behind me at the moment, 
I'm not sure the color on the screen is quite as beautiful as the color here. It's so beautiful. And it's just the form, the eternal form of the divine. And sometimes, you know, we sort of think, oh, yeah, it's just like a crutch. It's a belief just to make me feel a bit better about all the challenges of life. No, it's an absolutely real relationship, as real as you have with someone you can see with your eyes. But this relationship you can't see with your physical eyes. And so it's a subtle connection, a subtle relationship, but absolutely real. And when we meditate, we let go the consciousness of the body, all the labels become the seed. And through the eye of the mind, I touch God with my thoughts. And it's like I touch my lover. And that <clears throat> I begin to see that when I know who I am and experience that and know God, no matter how much the cyclone of this world happens, I remain in the calm center of the cyclone. You know, they say cyclones can be so destructive. <clears throat> you know, they destroy, and yet the center of it is often calm. I can stay in this calm center because I understand that there's nothing but change. And the more I attach my heart, the law says to anything or anyone temporary, I will suffer, I will build fear into my life. So now my heart is connected to who I am that's permanent and who God is that's permanent. And really when I've experimented over the years, I feel that when that's the platform of my life, the fear of change can really lessen and lessen and lessen. And then the third love is to love others as souls too. And I really enjoy this, that, um, you know, love their company, <clears throat> enjoy them, but no relationship is permanent. No relationship is permanent. So the more I build this sort of dependence on people, and it's not easy, I understand, because we feel vulnerable, we feel weak, and so I... If I have someone to lean on or hold on to, it makes me feel secure. And yet it's that very thing that starts to make me more and more insecure, paradoxically. Spirituality says, I believe, yes, you can't really, how we say, conquer attachment, if I can use that language. You can only replace it. And as you develop this powerful connection with yourself and God, that which is permanent, then I can enjoy everything, really enjoy it, but I don't attach my heart to it. So I free myself from so much fear and anxiety. And I really do feel that at this time, you know, this time where our world is changing so dramatically and many of us feel it's never going to be the same as it was even a few months ago. And we always feel, oh, the good old days. We want everything to go back to the good old days. I don't think the good old days are going to be there. So we have to equip myself. I have to have a new approach to life. And I feel so much of what's happening out there is saying that I have to become a more self-contained system. I can't rely on all these things around me because they're going to change too quickly. And if I really attach my heart to so many changeable things, I will be in constant upheaval. Yes, of course, it takes time. And yes, of course, it takes patience and practice. But to really give time to learning properly how to meditate and really have a spiritual practice, there's no better time because we have time at the moment. A lot of us have time to educate myself how to meditate and this is really what you know spirituality is so <clears throat> you know i wouldn't say perhaps a future without fear but maybe a future with less fear is even a better future <laughs> and i just want to finish on one thing that um the head of the brahma kumaris is a lady was a lady called daddy janky 
And she, um, I've known her for 45 years. And, um, you know, I remember she said when she was a young girl, she grew up in what is now Pakistan, Sindh. It used to be India. She said she was such a frightened, timid thing. And I traveled with her in many parts of the world and spent a lot of time. And I can honestly say I really saw a fearless human being. I couldn't see any fear in her of any situation. It's like she really conquered fear. And just a few weeks ago, she died. And I heard her so many times say, I'm ready. I'm totally ready to die. She was 104. And I, she was just, and when you step out of the cage of fear, you can really love life, you know, the happiness she had. But when I live within my fears, even if I have things, I'm always fearful of what might happen to them or what might happen. And maybe we say, well, that's what life is like now. It is because we've built my life on a false premise that I'm a temporary being and everything around me is temporary, but I hope that it will become permanent when it will never become permanent. And so spirituality takes us really deep into truth. And that's why I think, you know, we really love it. So maybe we can finish with a few minutes of meditation. And if you'd like to just join us for a few moments of meditation, I will speak a few thoughts. Just let me sit quietly. And begin to reflect. That wherever I attach my heart, I build fear into my life. If I attach my heart to ideas or beliefs, if I attach my heart to a job or a responsibility in life, if I attach my heart to other people, I love them, but I build so much fear of loss or change. And change is inevitable. Even if I attach my heart to my own temporary body, my bodily image, spirituality is to love life, love people, enjoy everything, but understand it's temporary. And so spirituality says to lay the foundation of permanence. And so first I need to know and experience who I am. So many times we return to this, but meditation is constantly going deeper and deeper into the truth that I am the soul. The soul always exists. I, the soul, sit on my throne in the front of the brain, in the center of the forehead. Although I wear my temporary body, 
I am not these labels. Not even a male or a female. I am a soul. And as I move into this permanent awareness of who I am, I start to move beyond the fear of loss. And I experience a quality of peace. A peace that no change can penetrate. I am a peaceful soul. Just feel it. Just feel so light. So lightly sitting in your forehead. And in this state, remember the Supreme. Turn your mind from all other destinations and remember the one relationship that's permanent. Our whole life experience is just the relationships with my family and friends, but they're temporary. This is a relationship which spans life and death and is absolutely real. Just allow the thread of your intellect to touch the Supreme, a soul like me, but a pure soul. A lovable soul, a soul that has absolutely no fear, because that soul retains truth, and allow yourself to be loved, just feel a purity of love. purity of connection, a purity of belonging. The more this relationship strengthens, I relax. No matter how much this world changes, this can never change. Because this relationship spans time and even life and death. Life is giving me this amazing opportunity to learn who I am. We have time. As our world seems to be going through a huge transition, it's a message to all of us that the way we've lived has been based on body consciousness, which is falsehood. And now I have to re educate myself to become soul conscious. I live in this state of self-awareness, 
the less fear I experience. And this is true freedom. Don't feel like speaking after that. Such a beautiful, peaceful meditation. Thank you, Charlie. And tomorrow, Charlie is going to speak on the topic of the wisdom of love. So we'll go from the fear to the love, the wisdom of love. And uh, from now on, we're going to. Uh, put on some quiet music and just have the picture there for a quarter of an hour before we start. So a quarter to ten, anyone who wants can come and just sit in your home quietly and have some meditation and we'll start at ten o'clock. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Sally.